Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our training. My name is Jeff Kelly Lowenstein. I'm founder and executive director of the Center for Collaborative Investigative Journalism. I'm very grateful to uh, Esther Herr, our project manager for her role in coordinating uh, this event, Jillian Dudziak, our design director for uh, spreading the word so actively, uh, other members of our team that, that I mentioned earlier and other members of our community. Uh, Serena is our metaverse designer. Um, Will is one of our former interns. Um, Callie is our current intern. And, and my wife, Dunraith, really is a very crucial member of our community. So very glad she's here. And of course, I'm really thrilled <clears throat> that Yafa uh, Frederick and Lois Henry, Yafa, our editorial director, and Lois Henry, the founder and, and really the driving force of SJV Water, um, are joining us today for this session uh, from Notebook to Story, Planning and Implementing Your Writing Approach. And uh, I'm really grateful to both Yaf and Lois for a bunch of different things. So when Yaf and I were talking about the trainings that she might participate in this year, she said, you know, Lois and I really did a lot of work together last year and we, we wrestled with a lot of issues as editor and as, um, as, as a reporter. And so maybe that would be a useful training. And so uh, there's already 30 people uh, who have joined us. I see Liana, who's a member of our uh, Water Data Repo uh, from Cuba via Europe is, is with us. Uh, so so uh, almost 100 people signed up. So I think this is a very resonant topic. So Yafa, among other things, is our editorial director at CCIJ. She has a big job at, at CNN. Um, she's involved in many different uh, civic activities. She's a terrific fundraiser. So Yafa is just a wonderful asset to our team and has really been with us since, since the beginning. And Lois, uh, for SJV Water, Lois and I met at the end of 2020 when uh, a woman who was running a program that was a, a uh, joint project from about eight newsrooms, nonprofit newsrooms around Water in the American West connected us and suggested that we uh, work together. And I'm so glad that Sharon McGowan made that suggestion because Lois, is just a dynamo. She's a tremendous reporter who has uh, decades of experience and is really supremely qualified to tell water stories. And so it was just such a joy to watch Yafa and Lois work with each other and learn from each other to produce two very different, uh, each impactful and each both award-winning stories, one that ran in the New York Times among many other places and then the other one that was more on our site and so on. So the format is that I guess Yafa will kick it off. Lois will then present as well. Yafa will also say some other things. And then after about half an hour or so, uh, we'll have time for, for questions. So um, Esther is throwing some relevant links in the chat. We'll have time at the end for questions and for evaluation. I'm so glad you're here. Please join me in welcoming our presenters, Yafa Frederick and Lois Henry. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. There's one thing Lois and I learned uh, working together last year, often the hardest part of the reporting process is actually sitting down to do the writing. And so through our collaboration, we've developed some ideas. And today's session is kind of divided into two parts in terms of our presentation. The first part will focus on kind of our general tips and tricks for how to go about the reporting, drafting, and ultimately writing of the piece. And the second one is we'll show you how we actually applied those tips and tricks to a story we worked on together called Where Is the Water Going? And I believe Esther shared a link with uh, for that story yesterday, but we'll recap it for you at the beginning just so that you understand the details of it. Now, before we get into the weeds of drafting, I thought it was helpful for Lois to talk through her process um, a bit. And Lois is, is, and I are very different kinds of reporters. So I'll let Lois kick it off with how she begins. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here. And thanks to CCIJ for including me in this. Um, yeah, uh, Yafa and I are very different. We have very different approaches to doing these things. So I, I just kind of wanted to highlight that because whatever your approach to doing something, it's going to be fine. You don't have to, you know, mold yourself into some unnatural template. Just take these ideas and use them um, in your own way. Like, 
Yafa is more organized and methodical and I'm more kind of seat of the pants sort of, sort of reporting. And so, but I do have my own kind of madness method um, as I like to, and Esther used to laugh at me, the squirrels in my brain run in a different way, um, but, but they do run in a direction. So what I do is I, I, for every story, it doesn't matter whether it's a big investigative piece or it's just a, you know, a quick hit daily, I start with my to-do list. You know, I pull up my take in Google Docs, you can use whatever you know, form you wanna write in and I start making a list. Um, what documents am I gonna need? What sources am I gonna need? Do I have their phone numbers? Um, what websites should I look at? Social media? Um, are there graphics that could tell this story or, or photos, et cetera? And so I, I, I get that list together and then um, I start going through it, obviously start working through it. And as I'm working through it, I start expanding that list. So um, every person I interview, um, and especially when it's a large investigative story, every person I interview, first of all, I ask them, am I on the right track? And then, you know, I'm also asking them, are there other sources that you can point me to? And so I, um, I, I, I add that to the list as I go. And um, as I also go, I, I bold things in the list that I think are gonna be really helpful. Um, a fact, a phrase, a quote, uh, a document. And um, I also, document the date and time of every person that I call, especially if they're potentially hostile witnesses, so to speak, and what they did. Did they slam the phone down on me? Did they not email me back? Did they slam the door on me if I went to their house, et cetera, so that I keep track of everybody that I, um, that I needed to get, everybody that I learned I needed to get through that process, and then what the result of that was. And I try and keep the dates and times as well, because if people start to question your reporting, it's really good to go back and say, even if you didn't email them, so you don't have an email track or a text track, if you have your notes and you say, well, I called you on you know, May 5th at 9 a.m. and you know, by 9.30, I didn't get a call back, so I made a second call. You know, so if you have that kind of um, backup to your reporting, it's very helpful in, the, in, in potentially contentious situations. Exactly. And so once you've done all of that reporting, the question becomes, how do you begin the actual writing? And this is where I say, you want to think of it as an elevator pitch. Pretend, pretend you have 10 to 20 seconds to tell someone what your story is about. In two to four sentences, what would you say? You'll see a little bit later on, Lois and I kind of take some liberties and say two to four paragraphs, because we think of it in terms of pitching, let's say, a funder to fund a story. But what is the story about? And if you can't define it in two to four sentences, I think there are certain key questions you can begin to ask yourself so that you can develop out those sentences, right? What cause Cause the issue you are reporting on to happen? What's allowing it to perpetuate? Is it political? Is it corporate greed? Is it legislative, even environmental? And who and how are the key people in this story involved? If you can answer all of those questions, you should be able to basically come up with your elevator pitch, which is really, and you'll see later on, will become your nut graph in your story. So as Lois mentioned, she's more of a to-do list gal, and I'm more of what I would call an outline gal. Um, and we'll show you both. But in terms of an outline phase, what I think is once you have your elevator pitch and once you have all of your reporting, you really want to sit down and figure out how to organize it, right? Not every single person you interviewed is going to be included in the story. Not every single document you found may be relevant to the story. And so you need to figure out how to organize that information. So before you begin writing the full piece, I step back and do the outline. The sample here is not a steadfast rule. Every story is a little bit different, but it is kind of guideline to think about, particularly with longer investigative pieces. So you get to your lead, right? How are you going to open this piece to draw your reader in? What sort of compelling anecdote, what sort of key character or place are you going to introduce to bring someone who may not be familiar at all with the place or the topic at hand into the story? Do you have those people or places? Do you have some larger facts and stats that support that this isn't just about this one person or this one place, but it's, it's a larger storyline that people should care about even if they don't live in that area. And that builds up to your nut graph, which Lois and I like to call the reason to care graph, right? Why are we writing the story and why should you be reading the story? That's kind of that elevator pitch, um, an adaptation of it, and you're going to want that fairly high up in your piece. 
And from there, you tend to open up the story to, do you have other compelling characters and voices? These could be the people affected by the issue, experts on the issue, government officials or corporate officials who are involved in responding to it or not responding to it. But you want to make sure that you have as many sides to the story. Obviously, you never want to accept that one side is the only side. And you want to make sure that you're getting comments from all of those. Sometimes, and we do this a lot at CCIJ, we push for solutions in our story. Too. So if the ones that exist aren't working for whatever reason, what might work? And obviously, if you're Lois, that might not be your favorite approach. So you might go just back to your to-do list and create what I would call the annotated to-do list. So what are all of the quotes that you highlighted? Where are all the documents that you underlined? And how might you begin to organize that? Would it be chronologically, thematically, section by section in each story? Which quotes would you include? Which documents? They're kind of two of the same, but the idea of doing both of these is to identify potential holes before you start writing. So I often say it's easier to do all of the reporting up front than to start writing, pause to do more reporting and come back to writing. Inevitably, that sometimes happens. But if you are doing an outline or an annotated to-do list, you can begin to identify certain holes. Ones that I find pretty common are key facts and figures. So maybe you have a UN report, but it's eight years old and the UN just issued a new report on the same issue. So you might wanna grab the latest data and not use data that is somewhat outdated. Or maybe you have one or two characters that are compelling, but you need someone from the other side of the issue and you don't have them yet. Or the one you have is like super dry and is gonna put everyone to sleep if you put them into the story. So you need to find perhaps a slightly more animated one who can provide some more color. And certainly in investigative stories, anytime that you're accusing anyone of wrongdoing, you wanna make sure that A, you've reached out to them usually more than one time. As Lois noted earlier, that you've documented how you've reached out to them and when you've reached out to them, because these are things you might have to include ultimately in your story. And if you do find these holes, I do think it's worth pausing and doing a couple of days of additional reporting before you get to ultimately what I call the throw up on paper stage. So I, I had a senior editor many years ago um, who noticed that I tended to self-edit so much that it would delay me from starting to write. And he used to yell, throw, throw up on paper, Frederick. This is a very common refrain, which means the longer you delay writing, the harder it is to begin. And to be frank, the less sympathetic your editor is because generally speaking in our industry, you are on deadline. Um, and your deadline is also your editor's deadline in many ways. So take that outline, that annotated to-do list and begin to write. And as you go, keep asking yourself certain questions, right? Pretend you're that outside reader. What are the key facts? What are the key figures that I need to include? What are the key sources? What does the reader need to fully understand the magnitude of the problem? But always keep writing. And every time you write a fact or a figure or you quote someone say, is this true? Do I have this recorded? Do I have a government report or an NGO report that backs this up? If this is an allegation, has someone else made that allegation too? Have I confirmed it with another source? Don't speculate, obviously, <laughs> cardinal rule in journalism. If you don't have all the facts, that's okay. Notate it. Keep writing though. So again, know your facts be able to confirm them. If there's something you can't confirm, make a note of it, come back to it later. But this I find is probably the, the, the slide I linger on the most, right? Very often, particularly in investigative pieces, Lois and I worked on a story that takes place in a farm country, central California, which for many people, even today on this chat, could be thousands of miles away from where you live. So the question you'd be asking is, why should I care about this story? And that's why I think it's very important, often in the lead, to give your readers a reason to care. And that begins with illustrating who or what is being hurt in the story. So one of the stories that Lois and I worked on together, it was one town, one lower income, largely Latino town that was being injured. And so we focused on the town. In the second story, you'll see we focus on specific farmers who are really being injured. But sometimes it could be a country or it could be larger democratic institutions that are under attack. The key is to spell out who is being hurt up front and to also be clear on the scope of that hurting. I often say, if you say to someone that costs billions of dollars, what does billions actually mean? Most of us will never see billions of dollars in our lifetime. And so it's also important to provide some sort of kind of comparative analysis. If a company made a billion dollars through illicit means, what could that company have done with a billion dollars? Could it have built X number of schools or hospitals or how many roads could have been paved if they hadn't stolen that money. So I think it's useful to bring in some sort of comparison to, especially when you're talking about facts and figures that are kind of beyond the realm of human capacity to understand. Obviously, there are limitations to, compare, 
toxins, but I do think it's worth considering that as well. Now, one of the easiest ways to get your readers to care is to give them a compelling character up front. That's why I focus on the lead. Um, this might be a person. You'll see in our second story, we had a really great farmer who gave us a really great quote to kind of kick things off. But it could be a place. Our first story was about this town that was quite literally sinking um, or even a thing. But something up at the top of that story that illustrates the scope of the issue. And that's why I say very very helpful to include one or two in your lead. That way also, once you have that compelling character and you have some key facts and figures, by the time you get to that nut graph, that reason to care graph, your reader's already invested because they want to know what happens to that character now. Um, so compelling characters are a great way into this. The other thing I would say is, especially with investigative reporting, you've reported extensively from one place and very likely your reader has never been or seen that place. So what did it look like? What did it smell like? What did it sound like? What are some of the key details you can bring out to really illustrate what it felt like to be in that place? Are there characters or anecdotes that characters shared with you that really spell that out? It's So it's helpful to include that in the story and really bring the place to life for the reader. The other thing I do think is very critical, and a lot of times Lois can speak to this later on as well, when you are an investigative reporter and you are knee deep in some of this research, you become an expert on a subject. And it's easy to forget that your reader is not an expert on the subject. So the water world that Lois is immersed in and that I kind of got immersed in with her has its own language. It has its own acronyms and its own jargon. And 99% of your readers probably have no idea what that stuff means. So if you are using technical terms, and at times it is critical to illustrate certain concepts or ideas or legislation, that's okay. But you want to be sure you define them and you use them judiciously and be consistent in how you use them throughout. And we'll show you some of those terms that we used in our own stories. But keeping it simple with clear language is really the most important. The other thing is you kind of want to prove you did the work, right? So it's very easy to go out into the field and if you don't get an exact figure, you kind of say by more than a million dollars or a large amount or sometime later, but you want to prove to the reader that you actually are the expert on the subject. You've spent time digging into it. So embrace specificity, give specific figures. If a company has embezzled X number of dollars, say what that dollar amount is. Don't say an approximate, right? If something bad happened five days later, say it's five days later. Don't say some time later. Um, that's key to kind of proving your credentials as well in telling the story. And most important, and in many ways I was this for Lois, get a second perspective. When you are very close to a story, after you've drafted some version of it, you may not be able to see the holes or a confusing phrase or even a section that requires additional clarification. So having a friend, a family member, a professional editor, if that's how your story is manifesting, is really helpful. And I also think it's helpful to give them guidance. So when you've worked on a story, you sometimes know, like, I'm really struggling with the conclusion here. It's just not sounding quite right. Or do you think that the government response is given enough space to breathe? Do you think I need to elaborate? So it's nice to ask your reader for specific questions, but you can also ask them for general impressions. And that's certainly what Lois and I did. So this is kind of our overview of our tips and tricks, but I wanna show you how we applied it. And I'm gonna turn it back to Lois in a second, but just to give, take one step back. So Lois and I worked on these two stories last year. And for the first story, we actually went after grant funding. So that elevator pitch I was talking to you about, we actually developed for that first story and were able to kind of adapt it for our second. So Lois, back to you. Sorry. <laughs> um, the way that uh, this all sort of transpired is um, I, I had a tip on a story about this, um, this very large farming company. Um, I live in Central California. Most people don't know anything about Central California. They think of LA and San Francisco and we're sort of further east in the interior and it's, and it's a big flat valley. It's, it's hot, it's dry, it's dusty, and it's um, covered in farmland. And it's a very different economy and a different sort of world. Um, and within this world in Kings County, uh, you know, sort of chunk within that, uh, J.G. Boswell uh, Company is, is sort of the company town. I mean, he almost owns this whole county um, and he, you know, farms in this county. But I got this tip that 
he was pumping out, he was selling off his surface water, meaning he buys water from the state and he gets water from the river up there, but he was apparently selling that off and then pumping out just massive amounts of water, storing it in a shallow reservoir and then using it later for irrigation. So he was essentially double dipping on the water, meaning he you know, was taking the surface water and buying it for very, very cheap and then selling it for very a great deal of water or a great deal of money and then pumping out um, uh, the groundwater. And that's been a huge problem in this valley because uh, farmers pump out so much groundwater that we that, that the land is sinking. So I got this tip that this was happening and that's when I sort of um, approached, uh, well, it was introduced to CCIJ because it was kind of a, a much bigger story than just one person could do. So um, we ended up working on that story in the first time, uh, uh, the first story, sorry, I've got this weird thing I'm coming up on my screen. Um, and that was about how this activity by J.G. Boswell was sinking the entire town of Corcoran. So we uh, put together this, this grant funding um, uh, pitch about how to, uh, about what this story was gonna do and say and, and how important it was and um, looked at, you know, where we were gonna go with that. And the, that story ended up being you know, taken by the New York Times and then, but we had so, and they focused entirely on uh, the Corcoran aspect of it, but there was so much that more that we learned it wasn't just that J.G. Boswell was selling off surface water and pumping out the water beneath the town of Corcoran. Another huge farmer named John Vitovich was also <laughs> pumping massive amounts of water and moving massive amounts of water. And so we had a lot of, of, of just information left on the cutting room floor after the New York Times took that Corcoran section. And so we decided to move forward and look at sort of the, the more systemic issue of how water is being moved, just looking at this one county. Now this happens all over in the Central Valley, but just this one county was this interesting microcosm. And so um, we ended up doing a little bit more reporting on Vitovich because we didn't have as much information on him because we had focused on Boswell in the first story. And then we realized we have a systemic story about how water moves in California and the oversight, et cetera. And, and you know, it sounded like these big, huge numbers, but we kind of needed to find somebody that, you know, the why should we care graph? Um, so we, we pivoted a little bit from all the, the massive amounts of data that I had assembled and looked for farmers. And that's where we kind of moved into the, the phase of trying to find out who was being hurt. And it's, you know, there's this sort of like, feeling like, oh, all the, all the farmers are the same. Well, they aren't. You have the Vitovich and you have the Boswell, massive, massive farmers, but you have a lot of really small farmers that are still trying to struggle to get along, et cetera. And this movement of water was hurting them. And so we pivoted to find out who were these people and what was happening in their lives. And I call these people our compelling characters, right? The people who answer the question of why should we care? Um, why should we care about these two titans fighting over water? Well, it's because of the, the examples we're gonna share with you now. Farmers who had been there, their families for generations, and, and suddenly they're struggling to survive and they may be out of jobs and there's no clear path to what they would do next. So in the story, um, which was shared with you, there are a lot of them, but we're gonna just highlight four of them because they each provided a different degree of color. And the one I wanna start with is Steve Walker, who is a Kings County walnut farmer. He's actually one of the, if not the first one that Lois interviewed. And he ended up giving us a quote that began our story and a quote that ended our story. Because what was really interesting about these smaller farmers is that they knew something shady was up. They couldn't quite put their finger on who or what was happening, but they knew water was leaving. They knew they had less water, water was leaving, the water that did exist was more expensive. And they did suspect that these big corporate guys, i.e. Boswell and Vitovich, were behind it. And C. Walker was the first one to say this to Lois, right? We've all seen it. We haven't sat down and put dye in the water to watch where it's going, but everybody talks about it and we're all concerned. And that was a great way to kind of set up the story for us of look at these small farmers, they're getting screwed for lack of a better word, and they know that something is up. But where we ended it, and this I think was kind of the, the, the touching and poignant part was that for people like Steve Walker, who have, his family has been doing this for generations, it's the, what do we do next? The little guy is gone, he said. It's only these big corporate tycoons who have the money and the land and the water rights that can exist everyone else is leaving. But 
he wasn't the all, only Waldorf farmer we included. Doug Verboon we included as well because he's someone who's actually involved in trying to address this issue and hitting roadblock after roadblock. He's on the Kings County Board of Supervisors, which is supposed to provide some sort of supervisory role in all of these water moves. And what he was saying is people do complain about it all the time, but the thing about these water titans like Boswell and Vitovich is that they sit on these water boards. Often they have outsized power on these water boards and stopping them from doing anything is damn near impossible most of the time because of the amount of power that they wield. So people know something shady is going on, they complain about it, but they kind of feel powerless, even Doug Verboon in some position of power, you might say, to do much about it. But they weren't the only farmers we included. Um, yeah, the, um, we also met uh, Jeff Gilcrease, and this is um, going out to uh, into the field. I can't, um, you know, to, to interview people is just I can't emphasize enough how beneficial this is because we met these people as we were interviewing Steve Walker going around with him, then we would meet these people because these farmers are all curious, you know, like, oh, what are you, what are you, what do you got these uh, photographers here for? What's going on? And so, you know, I start talking to them and gossiping with them anyway. That's how we met Jeff Gilcrease and his family. And I was really struck by the fact that, um, it, you know, his family's been there since the 1880s and growing crops that it, it he and his wife um, took over most of the land um, when he was a young man. And then in the 90s, they actually had expanded their farming, but recently had to sell that expansion because of a lack of water. And now his whole focus is, is making sure that he has enough water to keep his core farm going so that his kids might take it over. Um, but he doesn't know. I mean, I, you know, we asked him flat out, um, you know, would your, would your, and he's, he says, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if they can make it. Um, and his wife, Karen Gilcrease told us that, you know, this movement of water out of the county um, for profit might be legal, but it's certainly not moral. And we thought that was quite a, you know, a telling quote from, from these folks who are, you know, still struggling to make sure that their next generation can take over. And then there's David Avila. I think he was my favorite. Uh, he and his family have been around since the early 1900s. He's a Portuguese farmer. He's from the Azores, still very, very closely associated with the Azores Islands out there. Um, and they do things a little bit differently. They, they farm, uh, they do organic farming on little plots of land all over the county. Um, and they grow these specialty crops, fruit crops. And then they pack, the whole family is involved in this down to his grandkids and his great grandkids, you know, packaging this stuff and then selling it at farmer's markets up and down California, which has has been great for them. But the, the really interesting thing about the, David Avila is because they farm all over the place on these little plots of land, he knows everything and everyone. And he just does all this great gossip. And so he's been watching as, you know, little farmer after little farmer, as they die and their children can't make a go of it, then the corporations have been gobbling it up. And he says, you know, they're not buying it to farm. They want the water and water is our blood and they're essentially stealing it. So I felt like he, he and his tale were, were pretty compelling. And we included all of these voices actually fairly high up in our story as well, because again, we were trying to really draw the reader in and make the case like, these are people you should care about. These are people who this is their, their life's blood and it's being taken away from them. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the world of water is full of its own language of jargon, of acronyms, and we knew we weren't going to escape including some of them. So just an example of some of the words that we used, and we were sure to define them, um, subsidence. So when we talked about this town of Corcoran that was sinking, there's a technical term for sinking, and it is subsidence. And it's specific to the way when you take water out of the ground, the kind of clay layers of the soil pancake onto each other, and it sinks. And so that was a kind of key term because it was more than just sinking. There was kind of an act that was involved and that was driving that sinkage that we felt was important to include. But one of the things, and we'll, Lois will get into this in a little bit, the key question that arose for us is these water tycoons are taking all of this water out of the county. How is that possible? And how is that seemingly legal? And shouldn't the state of California be providing some sort of oversight since it's clearly impacting these smaller farmers? And so that took us to an acronym we came across quite a bit, SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So the state of California did pass a law that said you can't pump out more than you pump in, but it doesn't go into effect until 2040. So everything these farmers are, these big farmers are doing is technically okay until 2040. And that posed a real question for us about, hey, California, does that make sense to you? Because it certainly doesn't make sense to us. Now, 
we also knew that we had to give a sense of when we say small farmer and big farmer, what do we mean? And how much water is actually being moved? Scope was really critical. And this is where I say you want to embrace the specificity to the extent that you can identify it. And Boswell and Vidovich, and I'll let Lois take over from here, really do own an outsized amount of land in these counties. Yeah, um, the the amount of land is is kind of when I tell you that the Central Valley is vast, it is millions and millions of acres. But these guys um, are are a couple of the big dogs. In fact, these are the I think two of the top three owners. The top owner is um, the wonderful company, which is owned by Stuart Resnick, which um, is separate from this. But anyway. <laughs> Boswell owns more than 130 acre, 130,000 acres in Kings County alone, and you can see that he owns um, then 23,000 acres in Kern County and, and a small amount, 3,700 3, acres at Tulare County. Vidovich is basically right on his tail um, in Kings County with 102,000 acres, uh, more acreage in Kern County, and then even more in Tulare and Fresno County. So these guys are not small players. And this is important that they own that to understand that they own this where they own their land because where you own land, you are attached to various water districts, and those water districts get water either from the state uh, system or a river system or the federal system or some combination thereof. So they have control over that water through their water districts that they then have control of through their land ownership. And I know it, it, it's it's difficult to kind of, and this was this was what would the difficulty of this story is is you have to follow these dots, you know um, the state provides water to District A and District A provides water to District B and District B may sell water to District C, you know all through these different landowners and you have to follow that that trail um, and I was able to follow it enough to show that. Uh, combined, Boswell and Bidovich were moving 239,000 acre feet of state project water out of Kings County. That doesn't include the other kinds of water that they're moving. And the reason that we weren't able to, and we spent a lot of time trying to fill that hole, like, you know, how much more water, which, you know, which districts were they moving it to? Why were they moving it to these districts? And I, I tracked it down to a district um, here in Kern County, which is south of Kings County that they were seeming to move most of that water that neither of them have land in. So I was speculating that they were selling it to another landowner, which was probably wonderful because wonderful owns the land in these other districts that I was tracking. But when I got down to that point and I said, okay, I want to see sales records of this water, the districts told me, well, it's between private landowners. So you're going to have to sue us to get that. So they basically stopped me there and, you know, we were you know, going to be able to sue. And in fact, I talked to some lawyers about whether they, uh, you know, had a leg to stand on. And they said that I would probably lose that lawsuit if the public would. So we felt like that was a huge hole and we were really disappointed with that. But then we kind of stepped back and we're like, well, why should that be a huge hole for the public to, to see? Shouldn't the state be able to, to, why are we the ones tracking this water? Shouldn't the state know where this water is going? it's state water that's moving and shouldn't they understand, you know, that they're moving it out of one region and putting it into another region and the region that the water is leaving from has massive subsidence and people are struggling, et cetera. So they're kind of allowing the creation of this, of this uh, detrimental situation. And so we went back to the state and the state basically said, as you can see, the state, uh, the Carla Nemeth, who's the head of the Department of Water Resources, basically says in this, you know, she's, this quote is kind of like, huh, yeah, that's a really good question kind of answer. If you ask me, it's sort of like, oh, well, you know, if we know this is happening, we really wouldn't approve it um, under these uh, groundwater sustainability plans. But that's what Yapa was talking about. That doesn't go into effect for 20 years. So, <laughs> so you know, again, Yapa and I were like, dang, we, we, we still don't have this hole filled. We still don't have this hole filled. But then we decided, well, wait a minute. The whole is the story. The lack of accountability here is really what's going on. So it's one of those things that you, in the back and forth and the editing, et cetera, et cetera, and, and trying to plug the holes. Sometimes you got to step back and go, well, maybe the whole is the story, which is kind of what we decided here. 
Exactly. So it's taken together, and I apologize. I'm not quite sure <laughs> if you're seeing those lines on the slide that suddenly appeared. But taken together, you know, with these smaller farmers who were able to kind of make the case for why the story mattered, these larger water titans who were able to move this water, and then the lack of oversight from California, we were able to pull together this compelling piece that kind of combined the elements we talked about. Um, but we know we've been talking for a while. <laughs> so we are at the end of our presentation, and we're happy to take any questions, comments, or concerns that you may have now and I can stop sharing my screen as well. Well thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. A terrific, very detailed, thorough presentation talking through reporting and writing process. Uh, that idea of the elevator pitch, kind of trusting your method, outline or not to outline, the critical importance of compelling characters and color. Really important point about not trying to do everything in one story. Uh, Lois really emphasizing the importance of getting out in the field and, and a very uh, significant kind of conclusion around sometimes not having an answer can be a central point for uh, accountability. So I think just this past half hour has given you a flavor for just how uh, accomplished and effective uh, Lois and Yaffa, Yaffa and Lois are and just how well they they work together. So uh, we're going to turn now to questions. I just wanted to um, thank Lois and Yaffa again, and then also make sure that I uh, acknowledge Adam Eckelman, who's one of our ACE uh, fellows, uh, someone that Yaffa uh, brought, brought to our community. So Adam is, is joining us. Um, I did also want to mention for those of you who might be interested, uh, Winston Mawale, our ACE podcast host is here. We have two podcasts, one Transparency Talks, the other one called The Waterless. So if those might be of interest to you to share your work, I will put uh, Winston's email again in the chat. And uh, I just wanted to take a second um, and just talk for a minute about uh, CCIJ and just say that we uh, are an international nonprofit based in the U.S. We bring together investigative reporters, visual storytellers, and data scientists as equal partners from the beginning of projects to carry out ongoing investigations into key global issues. You are welcome to join and be part of our community. I still provide some information about that later, but I just wanted to make sure I shared that. So I see that we have a question uh, from Laura, and then I see also that George has his hand up. So why don't we uh, just start with Laura, and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Yaf and Lois. But Laura's saying, I'd love to know if you wrote together or divided the story up into sections and how the editing process worked collaboratively. So no, terrific question, Laura. So then to Laura, then over to George, and it looks like uh, Mohammed Tanvir after that. So yes, Lois or Yaffa to talk about the editing process. Yeah, I mean, I, I can kick it off. So Lo Lois was the primary writer. So I, and I was her primary editor, but we were deeply involved from the reporting phase. Um, so when, you know, I think we had weekly check-ins and it was actually, as Jeff alluded to, we're a larger team. So we have visuals people and data people and design folks who are also a part of these weekly calls where we would talk through where Lois was in her reporting process. What documents did she have? What documents that she did? not have, who were the best people she interviewed this week, who were the worst people she interviewed this week. But we were deeply involved um, on a week to week basis, ultimately working up to a draft deadline. Um, and we did do an outline for the second story. That was kind of how we identified that we needed to do more reporting on that second um, corporate farmer, John Vitovich. Um, but once we got to the draft, I was her primary, I was Lois's primary editor. And I, I am probably uh, a more heavy handed editor than some. Lo Lois can probably speak to that. Um, but in that very first draft that Lois sent, one of the things that really came out was that we needed more of those smaller farmers. We really need to, needed to answer the why should we care about these like greedy white guys in Central California question. Um, and so Lois actually did some additional reporting. She'd already interviewed a few of these farmers, but did some additional reporting. Um, and that kind of was our process all the way through where it's like, sometimes you don't always identify the holes until you start writing, that's the truth. And that this was a story where I think that became pretty evident. Um, when Lois shared with me a file of how many drafts we went through, I was somewhat horrified. Um, we went through a lot of drafts, um, but not every draft was obviously as, as incremental and changed. You know, some drafts might have had only two or three questions left. But I mean, Lois, you can probably speak to your own side of this. 
Yeah. Um, do you still have that screenshot you could share? Because I save everything, by the way. I save everything. I save every draft. I save, you know, everything that people, I put it in different files. And then I, you know, where'd I put that? Where'd I put that? But anyway, so I saved every draft and I gave um, Yafa a screenshot of how many drafts we did just on, just on the Water Titan story. That doesn't include the Corcoran story, but um, yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> writing that story. Um, I just remember writing, I was trying to, um, I have a really very plain style of writing and I was trying to be, I had just read this book by this fabulous writer named Mark Arax and he wrote about water and he's a very lyrical writer. And I was trying, trying to kind of like it, make it sound like him, how he would do it, et cetera. And yeah, for the first, that's the first draft. She sent it back to me. She was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> what is this? Please don't make me read this again. It was horrible. <laughs> I was like, okay. So, um, so it's really good. <laughs> I was <just> yes. <laughs> because writing these stories is, you know, when you have these giant investigative stories, you kind of don't know where to start. I mean, there's so many places you could start. I, you know, let's see, uh, they're sinking in town. They made the townspeople pay for the levy that they had sunk. Uh, you know, these farmers are going out of business. People are making massive months, amounts of money on this public resource. Is that right? I mean, there's so many different angles that you could get into. So it was really hard to kind of narrow it down. But when I interviewed Steve Walker, I was like, okay, he's our lead. He's that's it. Boom. Done. You know, when he says, yeah, we're all looking at the at the water and we know it's leaving. We haven't put dye in it yet, but we know we can drive down the canals and see what's happening. That's that was pretty compelling. Sorry, I rambled. No, that, that was terrific. Thank you, uh, Yaf and Lois. And I think from the outside, and I think this speaks hopefully to your question as well, Laura, that one of the things that really impressed me was just how much trust uh, that the two of you developed with and in each other. And that, that's a hard thing to do. And that really was a salient feature. And I think of why you could have some of those you know, challenging conversations uh, and then move forward in the spirit of, you know, we, we really want the best story possible. So that was, to me, really beautiful to, to watch. So thank you uh, for that. So George, over to you. And then uh, Mohammed Tanvir. Yes, George. Um, hi, uh, great presentation, Lois. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, just quickly, I love the way you turned the weakness into a strength. By the way, that was actually the most interesting bit of what I read as well. You know, just like I you know, just it reminded me of the um, series Goliath. You know, with Dan, Dan, Dan Quaid and I, Billy Bob Thornton when I was reading. I thought it was really interesting. Anyway, so I've got look, three questions. You can answer any ones you want. Uh, one is to do with the stats. It's quite a few. Uh, they're quick questions. The stats. Um, I saw there's a lot of. Um, water you know public water body stats like so was it hard to get them did you have to do a freedom of information act on them and yeah how, how hard was it there um i'm more europe and africa i'm based in south africa but i'm more of that side so i'm very curious to hear about the public the lawyer's opinion because surely you, you know you said you couldn't get the information just quickly i mean surely though you're that you're dealing with a public interest uh, issue with public water so it, it, I know they're selling private to private, but they're also buying state water. So surely there's a public interest. And I'm curious about the lawyer's uh, comments, you know, if you can in quickly, why he said that you, you wouldn't win that case. And editor's input, especially with the NY Times, did you get nagged a lot uh, by, it was the New York Times, you said you put it in as well. So I'm curious how much input and, and what sort of deadline did they set? I mean, because it's not a very kind of a timeless story. Answer any one of those questions. Sorry to throw them all at you. Just, yeah, it's a very interesting bit. So there you go. I, I think we can probably tackle all three of these, but Lois, yeah. let's start with, with the numbers because getting some of these numbers was, I mean, Lois had like secret access to a platform she wasn't supposed to have access to. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, that was probably one of the hardest parts of this. Um, okay, yeah, the, the, for the acreage number, not the water numbers, but for the acreage number, I have access to, um, it's a program, uh, it's, it's called Parcel Quest. And it's a, a property, uh, like as if you were a, a county assessor, you know, you, you could go in there and look up people's names and see how much property they own and where and how much it's worth and when they bought it. And it's, I, I got it years ago, got the access years and years ago. And I think the people who gave it to me for that specific story forgot that they gave me the password. So I can't write run reports and do all kinds of stuff, but I can go in there and just look at the basic information. So that was how I got that stuff, that, that, that acreage numbers. But yeah, for, if you're going to try and get acreage numbers in the United States, at least I know there's parcel quest and there's um, another couple of different programs, but you have to pay for them. 
So if I if I ever have to, I'll I'll pay for it. But I I do right now have this kind of, you know. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. As far as the numbers on, on the water, um, that's most of that is public information, but you have to know where to go. Like um, if someone if someone buys state water, if 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 Yafa buys state water, they have, a, she has a contract for state water. She has to go through a district. They don't sell it to individuals. You have to be in a district and those districts, even though they're run by the, um, by the farmers, they're public districts because they do public assessments on the land. And so they are public. So they have to give certain information like, uh, yes, the district contracts for a hundred thousand acre feet a year from the state and Yafa gets a hundred acre feet of that. They have to give you that information. And they have to give you this information about like when they transfer, well, they don't have to give you the information. What they have to do is they have to file with the state a, a, a form saying they're gonna transfer so much water out of district A um, to district B. And you don't know whether that's Yafa's water or not, but you can kind of track back and find out um, because sometimes they'll, a lot of times they'll put the name of the farmer on there. So then you have to go to district B. Okay, well, who's in district B? Where's that water going, et cetera? And so a lot of times in that form, they'll say, because the state will just go ahead and approve, they'll just stamp approval on, um, like if Yafa owns land in district A and district B, she can just say, hey, I'm moving my water to my land in district B. And the state will go, okay, no harm, no foul, great, no problem. But then what she does in district B is she moves it to district C and that, that may not be um, within, the state's purview. And that's where the sort of the tracking gets um, really, really difficult. So a lot of the information was public, but you had to piece it together. I, I don't know how many, I think Will is on this call, how many um, spreadsheets we I'm had sure. to try and, you know, get, like track where this water was going and all this kind of stuff, because it's it just gets really confusing. But then when it got to, to your last question, um, when it got to that last district, which was, um, it just gets so confusing, but it, it's out of the county that it came from and it was outside the state's purview because in Kern County, there's one overarching district that contracts with the state and they have 13 different districts within them. So the contract with the state, the state will say, okay, yeah, you can move it to Kern County Water Agency. Great, no problem, no harm, no foul. But then what happens within the agency the state doesn't track, but the agency does. So I had to track from the, from the agency, like, okay, well, where did this, where did this water, where did this Boswell water go once it got into Kern County? And that's when they said, um, well, I can find out where it goes. But then when I got to that district and asked about the cost, they said, no, 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 that's, um, that's private landowner to landowner, which I agree with you. It's complete and utter bullshit because it's the state facility, it's the state water, it's public districts. Kern County Water Agency is a public agency. I pay taxes to it, it's part of my thing. So I was like, you know, this is crap. But the lawyer told me that it is considered a private property right. So when, you, when it is considered a private property right, it would be this huge fight to open it up to public review. And I was like, I, I disagree, but I'm not a lawyer <laughs> and you are. So, you know, we don't have the time or the money to, to do that. So that's kind of as far as I got. Yeah. Sorry. And I mean, on the New York Times front. So, I mean, what was really interesting is I think we, we got the Times interested when we, I think, already had a draft of the story that was probably 3,500 words um, and they wanted 1,600. And obviously, as you can kind of tell from these stories, they're incredibly complicated and to do them justice, um, it's very, very hard to get it down to 1600 words. And so what ended up happening with the times is that the focus of the story really shifted to just being about this one town that had sunk. Um, and it was a part of this like larger basin. I mean, I think, six, I think it was like 60 square miles or something, but we were just focusing on this one town where this levee keeps falling down because and the floodplains are changing. And it's, of course, like poor Latino farmers at the center of it who are the ones who are going to be impacted. And that was like the only way to really kind of narrow it down into 1600 words. But it was also why we decided afterwards we wanted to do another story because we felt like so much of what we, we had had in that original draft never made it into the Times piece. And in part because of who the Times audience was, we were working with the California editor for the New York Times who was based in LA. I was thinking of this as kind of a national story running several pages 
stages in. And this is going to kind of be this like niche story that appeals to a very specific audience. And we actually want to take more of a step back um, and say, no, this is a much larger story that's going on here. And it's not just about this one town. So that's why we went and uh, <laughs> basically put together the second one. Yeah, and, and that, that it's a, it, thank you for those questions, George. And again, from the outside, that was a challenging reporting and editing process because Yaffa and Lois were working in one way and then the New York Times editor would come in and have a whole other set of additional reporting and wanting to shrink the story, but also add uh, more information. So I, I give Lois and Yaffa a lot of credit for hanging in there. And uh, as, as uh, Lois mentioned, Willa, who was one of our interns last summer, uh, is on the call and she and, and the other interns did fact checking and that was actually very important because the edits continued for the New York Times until quite quite shortly before publication. So the fact that we and had fact stuff, uh, yeah. from that yeah was was you know was really important for us. So again, you know, all hats off to, to Lois and Yaffa for terrific work there navigating a challenging, exciting opportunity. And then uh, our our interns Willa and Jane and, and Kira all helped with the fact checking. So so wonderful. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Mohammed. Tanbir, over to you. Yes, and then other other questions are are welcome. And I know we go till uh, about 20, 20 more minutes, but um, I know some people might have to leave. So Esther will start to put an evaluation uh, in the chat. Um, so if you could please fill out the evaluation, that'd be great. But Mohammed Tanbir, over to you. Yeah, possible. Thanks to Ruth Henry and Yapa Patrick for their excellent discussion. And I, I enjoyed it, but I have a, I have studied on environmental science and disaster management. I have a lot of interest uh, in environmental journalism. My question is, is there anything additional to consider when dealing with industry news on environment or climate change issues? Thanks. Okay, I, I, think, I, I think I heard that you're interested in environmental issues and that you're asking, are there other things to think about in doing climate change uh, coverage, climate, climate change, environmental coverage. So very important, broad question. Uh, Mohammed Tanbir is from Bangladesh, obviously a very different country from the United States, but e either Lois or Yaffa thoughts from uh, on, on that question about kind of thinking about environmental or climate change types of stories? Yeah, I mean, I can jump in because my other hat um, is at CNN and we actually created a whole uh, climate change beat that didn't exist until last year because we decided it was becoming a big enough beat that we needed to just devote um, a team to it. Um, and Bangladesh actually lends itself to that just because of, of I mean, DACA has its own kind of sinking below sea level storyline as well that I, I know we've reported on. Um, the key with climate change, and I'll, I can speak to this more from US audiences, Americans struggle to sometimes connect with climate change stories unless they're like going through a hurricane or a wildfire or they're, I mean, even the town of Corcoran was amazing about the story was like, the town was sinking and nobody wanted to talk about it. And some people genuinely didn't seem to even realize it was happening. Um, it's like, so, and that was in and of itself a story. But um, if you wanna get people engaged in climate change I, stories, I really think you need those compelling characters and towns where something really out of whack is happening. Um, and you can make people care by giving them someone or some place to care about, um, just to show kind of the, the extremeness of what that is. Um, I was recently in New Mexico on a story that I was working on for CNN where the wildfires have been in, intense. I mean, beyond anything we've ever seen before there. And you have whole, um, native tribes that are just completely displaced. And so we decided to focus the story on this one tribe that had been there for probably thousands of years, but certainly hundreds of years, certainly predating the United States, that suddenly was homeless. And the U.S. government was not providing them any resources for where to go next. And the U.S. government and native tribes have a very kind of specific relationship in the United States legally. And so we really focused on this tribe and the fact that these wildfires are becoming the norm. I mean, th these are not the exceptions to the rule. We're going to see more more of them, certainly Lois can speak to that in California. Um, so finding those compelling characters. I mean, Lois did that really well in the second story with these farmers. I mean, I could have read the transcripts of these farmers for hours. They were fascinating. Their views on the world were totally fascinating and they were a good window into some of these larger climate issues. But I mean, Lois, you, you do water work all day long. So you probably have your own ideas on this. Yeah, Lois. Um, well, as far as uh... My mute, sorry. As far as water goes in California, the, the big issue um, having to do with climate change is that our our whole system is built on a on the model that we get 
a ton of snow in the winter or some snow in the winter at some point, and that it then trickles down in the spring and summer for us to use in, in um, and we hold it in reservoirs and then we use it for irrigation and, and whatnot. And now um, we're getting uh, either no snow or uh, massive amounts of rain or warm snow um, that, that you know, or, or then heat that then um, just rushes that we don't have the reservoirs to hold it and hold on to that water for later use. So there's this, this real big shift um, and it it's coinciding with the groundwater law too, to try and reduce pumping, to try and do more storage in a different way, underground, et cetera, and, and try and figure out, you know, everything is above ground. We have, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, open air. We have open air reservoirs that, you know, with the increasing heat and dryness, uh, you know, the evaporation is just massive for, so we're losing a lot of water that way. And our open air canals are also, you know, huge water losses. So. So people are trying to rethink that and refigure that out at the same time as they're all, you know, the big guys are all struggling to continue to make massive profits. <laughs> yes, no, thank, thank poor you. Guys. Poor guys, poor billionaires. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Mohammed Tanvir for the question and to you, uh, Lois and Yaffa uh, for the answers. And I did want to mention also that um, one of my uh, mentees from the, one of the IRE conferences a number of years ago, Yvette Cabrera, uh, is on the line, and Yvette uh, is a senior reporter at Center for Public Integrity. She's very involved in NAHJ. She's one of the founding members of, of the Uproot Project, and um, has also gotten support from the Rockefeller Foundation. But Yvette has done a lot of environmental and criminal justice uh, reporting. So, if other people have things to to think about that, please you know please make sure to to weigh in. But we're very glad you're here, Yvette. Um, so thank you uh, for that, Lois and Yaffa. Other questions, comments, uh, uh, concerns, things that people wanted to raise um, to, to get Lois and Yaffa's, Yaffa and Lois's input? Okay, well, that, that's absolutely fine. Maybe then we'll, we'll shift toward uh, kind of clo closing thoughts uh, from from uh, Lois, Yafa and Lois, things that you would like to just kind of take just through the editing process or moving through, uh, as we go through. So yeah, any, any, any final thoughts before we wrap up and maybe we'll just knock off a little early, which there's no harm in that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the one thing Lois said this probably on the first call when we, we were chatting about this session is you just have to write. Um, as, <laughs> as daunting as it seems, sometimes you just have to start to write out, whether it's your outline or the actual story. Um, the, it, it's, it's a muscle and it has to be exercised. Um, and, and I think there has to be the expectation that the first draft is going to be a deeply imperfect draft. And that's totally fine. Um, I, I mean, I, I speak more in the capacity of an editor here. I am much happier if I get a piece from a writer that's half-baked than if I don't get a piece from a writer at all on deadline, um, just because I need something to help mold. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think the other element of this, and this, we didn't talk about this as much in our presentation, but Lois and I chatted about this as well, is never kind of taking anyone you interview's word as fact, right? Because the, all of these people are speaking from their kind of very subjective experiences, which doesn't mean that they're not real experiences, but understanding that there are multiple sides to a story, usually at least two sides. And I think in investigative work in particular, where you're usually trying to pinpoint like who is the bad guy in this story? You know, I think when we entered this, it was really like Boswell is the bad guy. He's the two, he, he runs the $2 billion farming company and we're going to call him out. And when we push came to shove, it's like, we couldn't actually prove he was doing anything illegal at all. And if anything, the quote unquote bad guy in the story was the state for lack of oversight. You know, the state that could actually do something on this wasn't and seems kind of okay with the fact that it wasn't. I mean, the comments from Carla Nemeth, this director of the water resources were, were shocking <laughs> in just how like uninspired she felt to do anything, even though these farmers were really being impacted by these water moves. Um, so I think, you know, allowing that your story may not be what you originally envisioned. You may have your elevator pitch and it's not actually what the final version looks like. You know, what we discovered as that hole in the story was a big part of who was responsible. And that actually started to come out even in the, the New York Times story when we were working with them on that because they kept saying like, is Boswell really to blame? How much blame can we pin on Boswell and how difficult it was for us to do that? So start writing. 
embrace your holes, <laughs> just like you embrace specificity. Um, and I mean, I do think one of the things I really valued is that we did have this very solid reporter editor relationship, which takes time to build. But I do think that behind every reporter um, is, is an editor. And so it's worth finding those people in your life that can be your editors. Thank you, uh, Yafa. Lois, uh, final thoughts from you? Uh, anything you want to share? Oh, I just think that an, uh, an editor is so important uh, when you're working on almost any story, but especially something that's investigative that's gonna that's gonna be you know long and complicated, et cetera. It's just so important to have um, an editor, a backstop, a, a anybody to read your stuff and say, you know, this makes sense. It doesn't make sense, et cetera. Um, I, back in my newspaper career, I was doing a, I, I did a bunch of work on um, child protective services. And I was doing a story about how child Prote protective services had taken these kids from this lady based on this really flimsy idea that she was, <laughs> anyway, it was just this really ridiculous flimsy idea. And I was kind of hammering the social worker in the story and my husband read it and said, but isn't he just going by, isn't the social worker just going by what the doctor said? I mean, the, the social worker's not a doctor. You know, shouldn't the doctor be And I was like, ah, oh, you're right. Damn it. <laughs> to rewrite this still was a great story, <laughs> but, but I did have to rewrite it. And, it. and if I hadn't, if I hadn't, you know, gone out there and sought out a little bit of a, just a, a general, even opinion, you know, there's, I wouldn't have been able to see that hole. So editors are worth their weight in gold. And then there was a, there was another um, person who had asked a question earlier um, before the session about when do you stop investigating? And Yaf and I kind of laughed about that because it's like, well, deadlines help. <laughs> you know? I mean, at some point, you've got to put a period on it and you know ship it, ship it in. And so that does help. But but in in all honesty, I'm still doing stories on these guys. So I'm still I'm still doing stories. So even though you might have you know not everything included in your investigation, and you know there's more out there, you can still put something together. Put it out, put it out there, let people read it and continue reporting and writing and writing. All right, well, well, wonderful. Thank you uh, again. One more, please. One more round of applause for Yafa and Lois. Thank you very much. And uh, just once again, Esther has posted the uh, evaluation link. So if you could um, fill that out, it's a, it's a very brief survey, but allows us then to seek support um, to get more uh, to be able to provide more of these trainings, which we will uh, send more out. And if you are interested in uh, becoming a member of CCIJ, we have a number of people in our community who are members. So we welcome uh, you to become a part of our community. So that information is at the link that I posted in below. We do have regular updates as well. So I, I will put my uh, email in as well in case you want to be added to our uh, weekly update. So that's jk.lowenstein at ccij.io. So thank you all very much. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing the connection, but thank you so much for joining us.